Hello, good evening. Um, I welcome all of you for today's uh, demo session. Can you can you all hear me properly now? Can you hear me now? All right. Um, thanks for the feedback. Suyash, Tom Pumilo, few more. Right. So, I I apologize. I apologize in case I am not pronouncing any of your name properly. Um, all right. So, um, so hi, uh, hi all. My name is uh, Karthik, and uh, I'm going to be your uh, instructor for today's demo. So, primarily the way I have. Um, uh, you know, structure today's session is that I'm going to have uh, this demo done in two parts. The first one hour or so will take one particular topic in the forum. Uh, the one that I have decided is features and uh, forwards. Okay, uh, and we'll primarily discuss a little bit about uh, this topic. The idea of this uh, demo is primarily to give you indication about two things. One is what are the typical topics that you're going to read further when you take up uh, when you sign up for a forum uh, level one exam, and uh, more importantly, to showcase the way we conduct our webinar classes as part of this team. Okay, uh, so it will give you an idea about how the typical classroom sessions happen, um, how can you interact efficiently with your uh, instructor, and how can instructor interact with you and stuff like that. Okay, and then uh, the second half of the demo. Uh, that is the during uh, later one hour we'll actually try to discuss questions that you might have any questions that you might have on either the FRM exam uh, what kind of preparation is required from your side um, and uh, you know any other thing like uh, what calculator should I use any other information uh, anything that you deem is uh, you know important to be asked and I'm there to help you with those questions all right guys so um, so let's start without wasting much of our time. I'll give you a brief introduction uh, about uh, me. So I'm, as I said, I'm Karthik. I have been in the financial industry now close to 10 years. Right? I am both CFA and FRM. So I'm both a CFA charter as well as an FRM charter. And uh, in terms of teaching, I'm relatively new. I've been teaching with Pristine only about a year or so. So that way I'm also learning how to teach better. And uh, every classroom session is also an experience for me. All right, guys. So I'll appreciate if we make this session very interactive. So any kind of question that you might have, uh, feel free to put it on your question box. Um, and I'll definitely make sure that you know all of them are answered. So before we get, I think by this time, you already got some idea about uh, uh, you know the way we do pristine classes. That is, if you look at it, I think. Uh, I have muted all your microphone from here, primarily because it becomes very complicated. Uh, see, I think when it comes to webinar classes in particular, you don't have the luxury of looking at each other's faces. So it becomes very complicated because uh, you know many people can attempt to speak at the same time. Uh, so, so you know, um, basically what happens is that uh, you know we we try to control it in this way saying that uh, only the instructor speaks and I have basically muted all your microphone then how do you interact with me uh, you can put it on your question box um, and I'll make sure that I'll read that question box so that I, first of all I read the question put on the question box so that everybody else who is connected will first get an idea of what the question is and then I'll proceed to answer your question okay so I have uh, one question coming from Natarajan can you be a little louder, please, or if you can come closer to the speaker? Um, Natasha, I'm actually quite loud uh, because as per my uh, sound meter here, it's already hitting uh, the maximum limit. Okay, um, I can try to be a little bit more uh, louder, but uh, what I request to you is please check your speaker volume connection. Most likely, you know, uh, it's probably at the lower side. I'll try definitely to be a little bit more louder than what I am. Okay. Um, so let me uh, get to the topic of today. 
as I said, the topic for today, uh, the one that I've chosen is uh, FMP. FMP stands for Financial Market and Products. So, and that too, in, uh, in FMP1, we are taking a very simple concept of trying to answer, to understand what is a forward and what is a feature. Okay. Uh, so this is um, a rough agenda of what we are going to study today. Um, we are going to understand what is a derivative and uh, we look at two basic derivatives in the market, forwards and futures and we will try to get some basic idea about them. Okay? Now what all we study is very important to keep a higher, uh, a bigger picture in terms of you know, uh, uh, what is it relevant from exam perspective. So when it comes to FRM level 1, um, there are only four topics which are uh, given vintage. Uh, one of the topics being FMP, FMP stands for Financial Market and Products, Financial Market and Products. And the weightage for that on the exam is 30%. Okay. Now what does all mean from exam perspective? Uh, FRM exam is conducted as multiple choice question. So especially your part one, which is called level one, uh, is a multiple choice exam. Uh, the exam is going to be a four hours of duration. And there will be 100 multiple choice questions. Okay, Each question will have four choices. You're supposed to go for the most appropriate choice. It's a four hour duration. All right. Uh, so previously it used to be two sessions of two hours each. Now we have uh, split that to uh, one full session of four hours duration. All right. 100, 100 multiple choice questions on the exam of which this particular topic, that is financial market and products, is given a weightage of 30%, which means around 30 questions on the exam would be from financial market and products. Now that's a much uh, wider scope of it. The one that we are going to study today, primarily, forwards and features, form only a tip of the iceberg of FMP. Uh, so at the max you can expect around one to two questions on whatever we are learning from today. Okay, uh, of course, you know, uh, as I said, this is a demo, and uh, demos are like your movie trailers. You know, they give you some idea about what lies next for you in the movie, but they won't uh, reveal everything about the movie. Okay, so that's the idea that we're going to focus on with today. Give you some brief idea about what is the forward and the future, and with that brief idea, you can at least answer one to two questions on the exam. That's the idea. All right. So let's get on. Uh, first idea is introduction to derivatives. So what do you mean by a derivative? Anyone? Let's take forward. I think it's already given on your slide. So there's suspense left. Derivatives are actually financial instruments. Okay? We're talking about financial derivatives in particular. A financial instruments that derive their value, hence the name derivatives, they derive their value from an, some other asset, some other asset, either the price of the asset determines the price of your derivative or the return of the asset determines the price of your derivative. Okay. Bottom line is, derivative is another financial instrument. Just like you have stocks and bonds, derivative is yet another financial instrument, financial security, which derives its value, which derives its price from either price of some other asset or from return of some other asset. Now your asset can be a physical asset like gold, copper, etc, etc, or even a stock or a bond. Physical asset means they have physical existence, they are tangible. Or your asset can be non-tangible, intangible. That is something like interest rates, volatilities. Okay. So the moral of the story is derivatives are also financial instruments which derive their value from 
some underlying asset. It could be either price of the underlying asset or return of the underlying asset. And the asset itself could be either a physical asset, that is it may have a physical existence, a tangible asset like gold, silver, stock or bond, or it could be an intangible asset such as an interest rate or a volatility. Okay. Uh, the whole of FMP is dedicated to studies of various kinds of derivatives. The most common derivatives that you come across in real life are forwards, futures, options and swaps. Okay, And uh, the underlying asset, as I said, is a more basic financial instrument. It can be a stock, bond, it can even be intangible asset such as your interest, rate, interest rates and volatilities. Alright guys, any questions? Okay, uh, no questions. Thanks for feedback, Sujat. All right, so let me move on. I know what we're studying is very basic, but uh, they say before you get into any detailed or before you get into the, any new concept, it's always good to start with a concept which is very basic. Okay. So now, in today's uh, session, we are going to look into one derivative, one type of derivative. The derivative is named forward contract. Okay. Let me give you a situation. Let's say you are a jewelry maker. You are a gold jewelry maker. Okay? What's your requirement? Or what is your fear? Your raw material that you use is gold. Right? And uh, especially in India, this is very true, that your gold prices are rising like anything. And every year it keeps rising up. Right? So if you are a jewelry maker, your fundamental concern is that one year down the line, the price of gold may become very high. And at that point of time, you are, uh, you know, your worry is that your cost of production will increase. So what can you do? Won't it be nice if you can actually enter into some agreement today? Okay. Let me try to explain this on a blank slide. So if you are a gold jewelry maker, your risk is that gold price can go up. Right? So in order to avoid this risk, won't it be nice that at time t equal to 0, that is today, you enter into some kind of an agreement to purchase gold sometime in future, sometime forward in time. Okay? Let's say one year later. So today you enter into an agreement with you know the gold miner saying that let's enter into an agreement today that one year down the line I'll purchase gold from you. But for the price of the gold that I purchase one year down the line is determined today. Let me say I'm going to give you thousand rupees per gram. Probably it's a very high value, but I'm just taking up a number. Right? Won't it be nice? So what happens? Today you have already fixed the cost of gold that you're going to purchase in future. So one year down the line, all that you have to do is give the same amount, 1000 rupees per gram today, get your gold, feel happy. Right? It doesn't matter whether the gold price have increased further or have they have decreased. You are always going to get, pay 1000 rupees per gram and you are happy. Right? So this is one example of a forward contract. So what you have done is today, as of today, you have entered into an agreement to buy something sometime later in time. That is sometime in forward and has the name forward sometimes forward in time. Okay? But the important thing is today you decide the price for which you are going to purchase something forward in time. Okay? Now there are some basic terminologies that you need to know. In our example, you being the jewelry maker entered into a contract to buy something in future time. Right? Buy something in forward time. So we say you are long the forward. 
Okay. In other words, the party who is going to buy something in future is said to be long the forward. If you are going to buy jewelry or you are going to buy gold sometime future in time, then somebody has to be willing to sell. Right? And that is a party through which you enter into an agreement at time t equal to zero. That is, as of today, you enter into an agreement to buy gold from someone. So the person, uh, in our example, the gold miner, who agreed to sell something, right? Who agreed to sell something to you at a fixed price, is said to be short the forward. So another way of rephrasing a forward contract is basically saying that a forward contract is an agreement between long the party who will buy something from short party, sometimes forward in time, but the price for the uh, purchase is already determined today. Okay. Now, any questions so far? Suyash, uh, Suyash, sorry, Suyash Gupta asks, so there is no margin of premium involved in this contract agreement? No, there is no margin of premium involved in this contract agreement. Okay, It's a simple agreement that as of today, I'm going to buy something tomorrow at a fixed amount of price. That's all. Okay? All right. Now, some more terminologies. Right? So far what we have learned is today, that is at time equal to zero today, I enter into an agreement to purchase something in future. The party which is going to buy is called long the forward. Right? And the party which is going to sell in future is said short. The time period at which, after which I'm going to execute the transaction, that is buy or sell, is said to be either expiration period or contract period. And more specifically, the date on which I'm going to execute the transaction is called expiry date or maturity date. Okay. So once again to use technical jargons, a forward contract is an agreement between two parties, a person who is long the forward and a person who is short the forward, where a person who is long the forward will purchase some asset from person who is short the forward on expiry date or maturity date of the contract, but the price of the purchase is already fixed at the initiation of the contract. That is at time t equal to zero. Now to use another terminology, the price in our example it was 1000 rupees per gram. Right? This price was fixed at the beginning of the agreement. And this price is said to be your strike price or forward price or contract price right so now finally to rephrase a forward agreement using all technical jargons a forward agreement is an agreement between two parties one who is long the forward one who is short the forward where the party which is long the forward will purchase some asset from party which is short the forward on the day of expiry or contract maturity date. But the price of the transaction is fixed in the beginning of the contract and that price is called strike price, forward price or contract price. Right? So on so at the beginning that time t equal to zero, you already agree on whom you are going to purchase from, 
what you are going to purchase from and at what price are you going to purchase from. So at the initiation of contract, everything is already agreed upon. That is, who is your short party, what are you going to purchase and at what price are you going to purchase. Right? On the contract date, that is on the expiry date, you simply execute the transaction. That is, the person who is long the party, along the former contract pays the money, 1000 rupees per gram gold and person who is short the contract will simply hand over the other asset which is gold. Okay, that's it. And it's a, it is basically called a forward contract because you are already, the transaction happens sometimes in future, sometimes forward in time, but the transaction mechanics are determined today. Okay, so that's the whole idea of a forward contract. Uh, so Suyash has a question. So there is either loss or profit for both the parties. We cannot hedge the risk. Yes. Okay. So now let's try to analyze what happens when you are long, when and what happens when you are short, and what happens when there are various values of prices in the end. Okay. So we'll understand that a little better. So this diagram is called a payoff diagram. Okay. Payoff diagram because primarily it tells what is the money that you are going to pay at the expiry of the contract. Okay. It is plotted between underlying price. In our example, this is gold price. Okay. Underlying assets price and y axis is nothing but what is the money that is exchanged in the end? Okay. Now let's take our example. That is, at time t equal to zero, I enter into an agreement uh, to purchase gold at time t equal to one at rupees thousand per gram. Correct. Now let's say this year I enter into a co uh, forward contract to purchase gold next year at rupees thousand rupees per gram. Now let's say after one year, that is, on the day of contract expiry. Let's say the actual gold price is 1200 per gram. Okay. Now, the person who is long the contract stands to benefit. Why? Because in the absence of the agreement, he would have to pay 1200 rupees per gram to buy gold. But because he entered into a forward contract, he is now only supposed to pay thousand rupees per gram. So there is a benefit of 200 rupees per gram to party which is long. Alright? On the other hand, if you look from party which is short, it's the other way around. In the absence of the forward contract, he would have simply sold gold at rupees 1200 per gram. But because of the forward contract, he is now forced to sell at a lower price, rupees 1000 per gram. So basically, the party which is short has lost rupees 200 per gram. Okay? So what do we understand by all this so far? Number one, there is a clear obligation. Right? Whatever you agreed to sell in the initiation of the contract is the price at which you have to execute the transaction. It doesn't matter what the price of your underlying asset is at the time of expiry. Whatever you initially agreed upon as your contract price is what you are supposed to sell or buy when you expire or when you exercise the contract. Okay? And because there is an obligation, if you are long the forward, if you are long the contract, you stands to gain when on the day of expiry, your underlying assets price is more than your contract price. Because that means that I can purchase at a lower price, which is the contract price, instead of paying higher amount if I now if I purchase without the contract price. And obviously, if a long party is going to benefit, the short party is going to not benefit. Okay? So we say that a forward is a zero sum game. Why? Because in a situation when your price is higher, 
the asset price is higher than the underlying price or the contract price, sorry. One party stands to gain, which is long party, and the other party stands to lose by exactly the same amount. That is, a long party makes a profit of rupees 200 per gram, whereas short party makes a loss of exactly rupees 200 per gram. Right? So it's a zero sum game. Money is only transferred between one person to another person. In this case, money is transferred from short position to long position. Okay? Uh, I have a question from Suyash. Is there any intermediary in this contract? No, there are usually no intermediaries in these contracts. Okay. All right. So now let's try to understand uh, what we have learned so far. Okay. Suyash says, so any of the party can default. Yes, Suyash, I'll, I'll talk about what is meant by default risk uh, in a little later, but you're right. You know. The risk that you run into a forward contract is that any of the parties can default. All right, so I'll talk about that a little later. Uh, you have to uh, bear with me on that. So basically, the idea is, as we said, at time t equal to zero, you enter into a forward contract to purchase some underlying asset. In our example, it was gold, right? At the contract price was thousand rupees per gram. We saw a situation when you are on the day of exercise. Your goal price is actually 1,200 per gram. In which case, we saw that your long party stands to gain and your short party stands to lose. Long party stands to gain because in the absence of the contract, he would have paid 1,000 rupees, 1,200 per gram. Whereas because of contract, he now only needs to purchase gold at 1,000 rupees per gram. What happens when it's the other way around? That is, on the day of expiry, Let's say the good price is not 1,000 rupees per gram, but rather it is 800 rupees per gram. Now what happens? That is, on the day of expiry, your underlying asset is trading at a price less than the contract price. In such a case, the exact opposite happens. That is, your long party stands to lose. Why? Because in the absence of the contract, he would have simply purchased gold at a price of 800 per gram. But because of the contract, and remember it's an obligation, you can't back off saying that, no, I won't pay. You know, once you enter into an agreement, you have to execute the agreement at that price. Because it's an obligation, now he's forced to pay at a higher price. Okay? And in our case, in this case, the short party stands to gain. Primarily because in the absence of a forward contract, the short party would have sold the gold at only 800 rupees per gram. But because of forward, now, he or she is getting a better price, which is thousand rupees per gram. Okay, so moral of the story is, when you are long, you stand to gain. When you are on the day of expiry, your underlying stock price or underlying price is more than your contract price. And if you are long, you stand to lose. When on the day of expiry, your underlying price is less than your contract price. Okay. So I have a question from. Way when, uh, from the payoff diagram, does X refer to the strike price and S refer to the current goal price? Okay, so let me go to the payoff diagram. Yes, uh, Way when you're perfectly spot on. Okay, remember this is an X axis. X axis plots what? X axis plots your uh, X axis. Okay. Uh, Sorry for the mispronunciation. I'll call you Brandon going forward. I, am, I apologize. Once again, I'm very poor at uh, uh, reading out names, so I apologize in advance in case I'm pronouncing anyone's name incorrectly. Okay, so please bear with me. Uh, I'm very poor at that. Uh, so really apologies in case I hurt anyone. All right. Um, but yeah, Brandon, you're absolutely right. Uh, so what we are plotting now is when you plot payoff diagram on the x-axis, you're plotting. What are the possible values of underlying asset? In our example, what are the possible gold prices that can... Sorry. I'll, I'll do that again. So when you're plotting a payoff diagram, on the x-axis you're saying, what are the possible values of underlying asset? That is gold prices that could be possible on the day of expiry. Okay? Now as you said, in our example, right, your gold price was rupees 1000 per gram was your contract price. Right? 
let's say on the day of expiry the actual gold price is indeed 1000 rupees per gram now who stands to gain literally no one right because there is longer short in the absence of forward they would have still purchased or sold at 1000 per gram because of forward also they are only purchasing and selling at the same price 1000 per gram which means that when your underlying price equal to exercise price x here refers to exercise price okay profit and losses zero that is there is no cash flow between long and short neither party stands to gain or lose okay as you go to the right hand side that means your underlying assets price is more than your strike price so somewhere here let's say that means uh, let's assume that this price is more than strike price that means this price is 1200 per gram now if it is 1200 per gram we know that that is more than your strike price and therefore long party will stand to gain hence you see positive payoff for long party right and as we said it's a zero sum game correct that is if one party makes money the other party has to lose money so if you go again to the right to the same point here short party is losing money and by exactly the same amount take opposite example the one that we were saying that is when your underlying gold price is less than your strike price let's say it is 800 rupees per gram then obviously the party which is long is going to lose money negative payoff right whereas same situation your short will make positive money right so that's the idea right money is only transferred between long position or short position or vice versa okay depending on which end of the spectrum they are okay money is never created not destroyed all right so the idea is a long position has a payoff like this that means for various so x axis plots for various possible values of gold price on the day of expiry and y axis says what all are the payoffs that i can get so when my gold price uh, on the day of expiry is exactly equal to exercise price that is 1000 rupees per gram nobody makes any profit if my gold price is more than that is we look at this uh, scale this is on the right hand side of this that means my gold price on the day of expiry is more than my exercise price in which case long party makes a positive payoff right this is a positive contract if my gold price is less than the underlying price or sorry, if the gold price is less than the contract price, then my long party makes plus, it's a negative payoff. Okay, and same analysis we can do at the short position. All right, guys. Thanks uh, for the compliment, uh, Brandon. Suyash so, has a question. So, are these private contracts? Yes. So that is where the next thing that we need to understand is forward contracts are actually we say they are customized contracts that is they are basically private contracts between two parties all that you need to do is find another person who is willing to buy or sell at a particular price from you and voila you are ready with the agreement okay so does, so forward contracts are not traded on exchanges okay it's basically a private agreement all that you need is so if in, if you are a gold jewelry maker you just need to find someone who is willing to enter into a forward contract and that's it you're done just ink an agreement and on the day of uh, execution do your commitment you're done okay this also leads to one of the limitations of forward contract okay because it's a private agreement there's no guarantee that people will honor the agreement okay so the same example right uh, I entered into a strike price of uh, 1000 rupees per gram okay let's say actually the gold price uh, rose to 2000 rupees per gram on the day of expiry now this is profitable for me that is if I am long position this is profitable for me only if the short party honors its commitment right what happens if the gold miner says go away I'm not going to give you money okay I'm not going to sell you at 1000 rupees per gram you do whatever you want again that's a problem for you okay and because they are private agreements uh, 
it's not that you can actually you know take him to court and do something actually there are still international courts available but it's a very difficult uh, process okay so that leads to a limitation of uh, forward contract that they are largely non regulated okay and therefore this risk that one of the parties will not honor the commitment becomes very high and that risk that one of the parties will not honor the commitment is called credit risk right the risk that the party which is supposed to pay money in our example if the gold price doubled on the day of execution then long party is going to make money whereas short party is going to lose money big amount right so the party which is losing money if he or she decides not to honor the commitment that is they say i will not give you money then long party stands to lose because he was supposed to get money he didn't get money and that risk is called credit risk okay any other question guys so what all we have seen so far we have basically seen that your your uh, forwards are basically an private contract forward is a contract to enter into some uh, you know enter into some agreement enter into some transaction sometimes forward in time okay and then hence the name forward interestingly you will execute the transaction sometime forward in time but with whom are you going to do the transaction what are you going to buy or sell and at what price are you going to buy or sell is already agreed today okay and that is called your contract price or strike price okay and uh, that's the point right so you agree on what you go going to sell how you are going to sell at what price are you going to sell today but you execute the transaction only sometime later and the party which is going to buy something is called long the forward the party which is going to sell something is called short the forward all right and we also saw we also analyzed so what happens when when the underlying asset price is more than your strike price then long the party stands to gain it's a positive news for long the party but unfortunately it's a bad news for short the party vice versa that is when your underlying price is less than the strike price long party starts to lose whereas short party starts to gain okay and obviously uh, the case when your strike price equal to your underlying price on the day of expiry neither party stands to gain or lose it's a zero sum game okay um all right so i have i have a question from jesse uh, isn't it a counterparty risk yes you know um so in general the risk that somebody doesn't honor the agreement is called a credit risk okay in our example so this is a term used mostly on products that don't trade on exchanges we say so there are two kinds of markets that you need to know one is called otc over the counter another one are exchanges okay exchanges as we all know are standardized is basically a standardized market where everybody can trade with each other but otc is more a private agreement right so whenever you have derivatives that are private agreements we say they are otc derivatives so in our example your forwards are otc products that is they don't they are not listed on exchange rather private contracts execute them so whenever you have otc product credit risk is called a counterparty credit risk that is the idea is in all these otc product there are only two parties one party which is long one party which is short so the credit risk that you run into is that your opposing party that is your counterparty doesn't honor the commitment and therefore it is called a counterparty credit risk okay so jesse is also short and as counterparty risk one of the stories they all mean the same thing whether you are talking about a credit risk credit risk is a generic concept when applied for otc derivatives that is derivatives that are private contracts you generally term them as counterparty credit risk it's also short term as counterparty risk okay gopal krishna has a question who will be the regulatory for forward contracts so there are uh, you know standard regulatory uh, institutions uh, probably taking a detour but since you asked the question i tell you 
there is a association called ISDA. Okay, it's called International Swaps and Derivatives Association. Okay. And that is supposed to be one of the regulatory agencies trying to look at all private contracts that are executed in the world. Okay, and they have some guidelines saying that you know what happens if uh, uh, your counterparty you know defaults. What can you do? What are the legal proceedings that you can go ahead with? So there is one kind of regulatory agency which is called ISDA, International Swaps and Derivatives Association. But again, you know the like unlike in an exchange, if a if a let's say if a stock uh, doesn't pay you money or let's say if a bond doesn't pay you money you can easily go into a, a court and uh, file for a case in a derivative that is very difficult because there is no well established legal system for counterparty issues okay so as i said having said that there is something called isda agreements that exist uh, but there are more guidelines there are more there are more uh, you know uh, indications of what you should do if something is a problem Okay. Again, they don't give you guarantee that uh, all your problems will be resolved. They simply say what are your guidelines, what are your good practices to follow, primarily. Okay. All right. Uh, now, now we'll get into a little slightly advanced topic, which is how do you price a forward contract? Okay, what do we mean by pricing of our contract? Basically, we are asking a question: What is the most appropriate contract price? What is the most appropriate strike price that I should assign so that there is no arbitrage? Okay, I know we are learning a lot of uh, jargons today, but that's the good part about learning finance, right? You tend to use a lot of jargons. So what do you mean by arbitrage to begin with? What is arbitrage? Arbitrage primarily means that two assets or two portfolios of same risk are trading at different prices. Right? And if you are smart, what you can do is, since since it's two portfolio of the same risk, ideally they should be trading at the same price. Remember, in finance, you assign price to risk. Higher the risk, you want to pay higher prices. Lower the risk, you are okay with getting lower the price. Okay. So if there are two portfolios having the same risk characteristics, but if they are trading at different prices, then there is a arbitrage opportunity. What you can do? You can buy the portfolio which is trading at a lower price and sell the portfolio which is trading at a higher price. Remember in arbitrage or, or in the end of the day in finance, the goal is to make profit. How can you make profit? When you, can, when you buy at a low price and sell at a high price. right? So when there are two assets having the same characteristics, ideally they should be trading at the same price. But then in federal they are trading at a different price. You can buy at a low price, buy the one which is trading at a low price and sell the one which is trading at a high price. By doing so, you will actually make money. Okay? This is called arbitrage. Arbitrage basically means you are making riskless profit. That is, without taking any risk, you are making profit. Okay? A very simple example of arbitrage is your location arbitrage. And most of us do that. right? So, uh, what is an example? Let's say, um, in, um, let's say in Punjab, okay, you are um, your price of rice is very low, right? Because rice or wheat are uh, grown extensively in Punjab, whereas something in South India, let's say somewhere in Kerala, your uh, price, uh, your uh, you know, rice is not grown that much. So what you can do? You can do arbitrage. You can go to Punjab, buy rice at a cheaper price, come to Kerala, sell that at a higher price, and by doing so, you're making profit. Primarily because you're not taking any risk. There is no risk that there is no risk of cultivating wheat or rice by yourself, right? It's a symbol: purchase at a lower price, selling at a higher price. Okay. So this is an example of arbitrage. 
So you have said, for example, trading on two different exchanges. Yeah, exactly. You know, this is what my example was. That is, we can buy at a lower price, sell at a higher price in different locations. Okay. So now, based on that, we are trying to look at a concept of how do you value a forward contract? That is, how do you price a forward contract so that there is no arbitrage? So what do you understand by that is, when I say I want to price a forward contract, okay, I am saying what should be the appropriate contract price? What should be the appropriate strike price? Okay, what should be the right strike price so that in the absence of any other condition, neither party stands to gain or lose. So let's say if I am a person who is coming up with an agreement, forming an agreement, then I would say at least if my strike price equal to my no arbitrage price, then as of today's conditions, no party is either gaining or losing. Okay. So for this you need to know your uh, time value of money concepts. I assume most of you understand what is time value of money concept, uh, but let me give you a very brief uh, idea of what that is. Okay, so when it comes to finance, money has two parts. One is it has denomination, magnitude, and it also has a time value. What it means is, I give you two choices. As of today, I'll give you thousand rupees, a thousand dollars. Versus the other choices. One year down the line, I'll give you thousand dollars. Which one do you take, and why? Yeah. Gopal Krishna says I'll take today. Why? Because common sense says that, right? If I get thousand dollars today, what I can do is I can simply invest that in a risk-free asset. Let's say I can invest that in a bank savings account. Correct? And by doing so, I'll get what? I'll simply get an interest of 4% as of today. Right? So after one year, I'll get the value grows to 1040. Okay? That is, in the absence of anything, if I get money today, I can simply invest that in a risk-free asset and the value one year down the line grows to 1040. Okay? That is always better than getting 1000. Okay, so that is what your time value of money is. That is, if you look at these two choices, the magnitude of money was exactly identical. That is, thousand dollars today versus thousand dollars one year down the line. But there was a time value of money. That is, thousand dollars received today is much more than thousand dollars. The same thousand dollars received later, primarily because I can grow the money over time. Okay. Now there are some more terminologies that you need to know. This thousand forty is called future value of this thousand dollars today. That is, if I invest thousand dollars today in a simple risk-free rate, risk-free rate means I am getting some return without taking a risk. The most common example of risk-free rate is when you invest in a bank savings account, right? There is no risk for you, assuming that the bank stays forever. In which case, my money will give me a 4% interest right so when so this 1040 is called the future value of this thousand dollar invested at a risk free rate of 4% for a year mathematically i can write this as if a is the amount that i'm going to invest today okay at time t equal to 0 and if r is my risk free rate then the future value of the asset will be a e power r into t, where t is my time period. Okay? So this is a simple time value of money idea and hopefully you also got what is meant by future value. Alright? Now, we are going to use this concept in pricing a forward. Okay? So in a forward what happens? You and I enter into an agreement to do what? At time t equal to 0, we both enter into an agreement to purchase something later at time t equal to 1. 
Okay. In other words, in the initiation of contract, there is no money that is swapping hands. All the money is swapping hands only at time t equal to 1, that is after 1 year. So, if I am long the forward contract, what I can do? Today I am fixing the price, right? The same example, I am fixing the price 1000 rupees per gram. But today I am not paying that 1000 rupees per gram. Correct? I am going to pay this 1000 rupees per gram only one year later. Sorry, okay? I will draw it again. So time t equal to 0, I am fixing the contract price of 1000 rupees per gram. But all the money movement happens only on time t equal to 1. That is on the expiry of the contract. Which means that if I have this 1000, so in the absence of forward, I would have paid this 1000 rupees per gram today, but because of forward, now I can afford to pay this money only one year down the line. And uh, basic mathematics or basic finance says that if I simply invest this 1000 today in a risk free rate, the 1000 can grow to some value. Let's say the 1000 grows to 1000 e per r into t, where r is my risk free rate. Okay? <coughs> So what does it mean? The idea is, as of today, if I execute the transaction, I have to simply pay 1000 rupees per gram. But because I am smart, I am going to enter into a forward contract so that instead of paying this 1000 rupees per gram today, I am going to only shell that money, shell that money out sometimes later in time, one year down the line. Okay. Now basic mathematics says that there is a time value for money. The 1000 rupees per gram today is actually worth 1000 e per RT one year down the line. Then why is it that, now when it comes to a forward contract, isn't it unfair that the long party doesn't pay money now, he pays only later and I still leave the amount to be 1000 rupees per gram. Basically a long party is going to, going to be benefited because short party doesn't benefit because short party is still having the gold whether it's now or later. A long party can invest the money and make money out of it. Right? So that is what we say that in order to avoid arbitrage, a true a right price of your forward contract would be not thousand rupees per gram, but rather thousand E per RT. In other words, as of today, if I'm entering into an agreement and today's gold price is rupees 1000 rupees per gram, then my forward price should not be same as 1000 rupees per gram, rather it would be slightly higher, 1000 E per RT. Then neither party are gaining or losing. From a short perspective, he, whether he has to sell gold today or later is the same. Whereas from a long perspective, had the contract price been equal to today's gold price, he would have simply made profit. Right? He would have put $1,000 uh, for a year, he would have earned 1000 E per RT, whereas he's only going to spend 1000 rupees. That would have been an unfair advantage to the long party. Okay? So that is what leads you to this formula, that is, as of today, when I'm entering into a forward contract, my forward price, the no arbitrage price, should be S0 E per RT, S0 is my current gold price, that is current price of gold. So you need to remember these notations very well, right? As of today, remember the transaction happens sometime in future, one will out the line, but the agreement is inked today. So as of today, what is my underlying gold price? That is S0, right? In our example, that was 1000 rupees per gram, right? So the, ideally, the forward contract should not be equal to 1000 rupees per gram, but rather it should be 1000 e per RT, where R is your risk free rate. And mathematically, this is your continuous compounding. Okay, So I will I want to avoid giving too many uh, concepts on a single day. So we will learn when we study FRM, what is meant by continuous compounding rate. Okay. Uh, Okay, so Suyash says, uh, so it is continuous compounding. Yes, it is continuous compounding rate. Suyash, as I said, I'll 
we will discuss about the difference between continuous compounding versus a normal compounding a little later, probably in the class. Okay, I don't want to give too many concepts on the same day. Gopal Krishna has a question: Why are we considering only risk-free rate, but gold and stock are not risk-free? That's right. Golden stocks are not risk-free, but when we say risk-free rate, we are talking about. First of all, I think you got it right. That is, risk-free rate is basically the rate of return that I get when I'm not taking any risk. Okay, what will that be? At a very high level, right? Um, uh, I can simply let's say I have some money, thousand rupees. I can simply put that in my savings account, bank savings account. Right? What is the risk involved? Probably very less. Let's assume that there is no risk of bank getting collapsed. In which case, your thousand rupees is guaranteed. Correct? But what is even better is your bank gives you a return. Right? So for your savings account, probably your current return is four percent per annum. Right? So this four percent is said to be your risk-free rate. Okay? That is without taking any risk, I'm still getting. A minimum return of four percent. Now, Gopal uh, Krishna, the point that I'm saying is, when I'm entering into a forward contract at time t equal to zero, right? I enter into an agreement at what price I am going to purchase some time later. But at time t equal to zero, that is as of today, I am not going to spend that money. I'm only going to spend that money later, one day down the line. Forget what the underlying asset is. Forget what the forward contract is. Okay, forget the forward contract. When it comes to forward forward contract, all that you need to know is I'm not spending money today. I'm spending some time in future. So what happens if I already have some money? Then if I already have some money, I can put that in some bank. Okay, some savings account bank. Let's say Axis Bank or let's say XBI. Right. So what money I have? Instead of since I am not spending now, I am only going to spend in future. What I'll do is forget about the forward contract. The money that I have in my pocket, I'll go and deposit that to SBI, okay, or Axis Bank. This will give me a return, right? So one year I deposit here. After one year, when I get my money back, that is instead of thousand rupees now it is thousand and forty, I'll withdraw only thousand rupees and invest it here. Okay, so these two are independent transactions. Okay, forget about what you want to purchase as the underlying. I can still take the money and invest that in a risk-free rate. Are you following? So these two are independent transactions. Okay, the rate here is not dependent on the risk of this transaction. Simply, I have some money and I've invested that into a bank. That's all. All right. Any other question, guys? Um, how about others? I have uh, I've seen a lot of students have joined, but they are quite passive. We have Abiola, we have Comland, we have Elaine, Eric, Geeta Jali. Um, so many more. Okay, so I hope you guys are following. Uh, if not, uh, please let me know. If you have any questions, I'll be happy to explain. All right. So I think, uh, given that we have already overshot our time, I'm going to end the demo for today. Uh, as I said, the idea of the demo is to primarily give you some insight into what kind of topics are you going to study, uh, and uh, more importantly, how do you or what are what is a typical webinar session as part of this thing? You know, what are the typical kinds of classes that you take? How you can interact with us. So I think by this time, most of you are comfortable using question box, and most of you are also comfortable how session happens. That you know, your instructor will read your question, and then uh, you're going to basically, um, you know, answer that question, right? And you get the answer for that. So Suyash has a question. Are you not going to cover future today? Uh, Suyash, I wanted to cover future today, but given that uh, we only are left with uh, 45 minutes for the demo, uh, I thought I'll actually. Uh, get into the later part of the demo, which is answering any questions that you might have regarding FRM exam. Okay, um, and of course, you know, uh, when we are doing an actual class on financial market products, we'll be learning all this 
you know all this uh, topics again in detail. All right. As I always keep saying, uh, demo is a movie trailer. Okay. Uh, I can't give you all level of detail right away, primarily because finance is a very broad, um, you know, it's a very deep ocean if you look at it. Okay, we can keep getting into the depth as such. Um, so you know, uh, the same forward and future class can take. I can go on speaking for four hours. Okay, that's not going to do any benefit. The primary idea of doing the demo today was to give you some insight into what are the typical classes. How do you interact with the faculty and stuff like that? All right. Um, so Jesse had also had a question. Uh, will you speak of arbitrage process today? Uh, Jesse, no. You know, as I said, I'm going to end the demo now, and I'm going to move on to the second part, which is uh, any questions that you might have from an FRM exam perspective. So I hope that by this time you got some idea about forwards, okay, and some idea about what are the kinds of topics that you're going to study in FRM. And more importantly, you also got an idea about uh, how do your typical classroom sessions of pristine happen on web. Okay? So that was my goal of uh, you know, introducing you to these concepts. Um, as I promise, uh, you know, once we study uh, your, uh, once we actually start doing the actual course curriculum of FRM, I definitely, uh, you know, get into the breadth and depth of arbitrage and uh, financial model and financial products, etc. Et All right. Um, so thanks for the feedback, Jesse. Um, I appreciate it. Uh, Suresh has a question. When are you going to take next session? Uh, Suresh, I'm not sure about that because usually what happens is you know there is a schedule published. Uh, so you know, uh, Pristine have a good set of instructors, uh, not only me, there are many other instructors also. Uh, and depending on you know, uh, who is available on which weekend, the classes are allotted. You know, so depending on how you, uh, you know, um, or depending on which weekend we are talking about, if I'm available, I'll definitely take a session for you. Otherwise, somebody else who is also equally capable, if not more, uh, somebody who has done CFA and FRM can also, will also be taking classes for you. Right? So from your perspective, uh, the fact all faculties of Pristine are quite equally capable of uh, taking a good class. Okay. Um, so I have a question from Abiola. Uh, how can we meet up with the missed slides you presented before I joined? Abiola, no issues. All that you can do. So all these sessions that we did today, um, and as I speak, the session is being recorded. Okay. So what you can do is uh, please contact your Pristine representative. Uh, he or she will be able to give you a link for the video session, a video recording for the session today, and uh, you can always uh, figure out you know what happened uh, before you joined the class. Okay, and what is better is if you have any questions regarding any of the concepts that we saw today, or in general, uh, even during. So today is only a demo, but in general, let's say you. So in general, any class that we take on webinar is actually recorded for the whole five-hour duration, and you are given uh, you are given a link to the video recording, in which case you can always go back to the recording and refer. And what is more interesting is, let's say while referring the video recording, you suddenly have a question to ask. What do you do? Right? Because it's a video recording, you don't have the luxury of asking question in real time and getting an answer, like what we are doing now. The real time interaction is not possible. So what do you do? There is a thing called a pristine forum. Okay, once you join Pristine, that is when you pay your uh, uh, fee and you become part of the Pristine family, you get a Pristine login. Okay, on the login there is a link to something called a Pristine forum. So all that you need to do is go to the forum, post a question, and it's guaranteed that within 24 hours somebody will respond to your question. Okay, so that way. Uh, there are various avenues for you to either catch up on what you missed or to ask any questions that may pop up your mind. Um, Gopal has a question. Um, John C. Hull book on FNO, is it necessary to read or only perceive material enough? Um, yeah, so I think to all, to answer all your questions, uh, let me take to a slightly different slide. Okay. Uh, 
give me a moment. Okay, so basically, um, so this presentation basically has information about what you're looking for. Now, coming to what are the good textbooks to read, okay, and what do I recommend? Uh, let me take you to this slide, okay. Pristine materials are definitely good. But I strongly recommend two more supplementary uh, textbooks. Number one, there is a textbook called FRM Handbook. Okay, the author is Philip Jorian. Okay, the author is Philip Jorian. It's a must-have book in my opinion. Uh, more so for your level two because there are very good set of questions. Uh, very good previous year's question papers which are included in this uh, handbook. So it's definitely a very useful book to possess uh, from my exam perspective. Okay, FRM Handbook by Philip Jorian. The other important book that I recommend is Option Futures and Other Derivatives by John C. Hull. Okay, again it's a very very good textbook primarily because of the way he has explained the concepts. It's a very, he has a very nice way of explaining concepts. And what is more important is the whole of FMP that you study, that is financial market and product, even GARP core readings. So GARP has something called as a core reading, which is nothing but a good collection of uh, textbooks. So they say that for FMP, refer to so-and-so textbook for options. For futures, refer so-and-so textbook. For quants, refer to so-and-so textbook, so-and-so chapters. Okay. So a collection of all such chapters from various textbooks is basically what is called as a GARP core reading. Okay, uh, I would say it's a good thing to have a GARP core reading, but not a must to have. Okay, but I would say definitely these two textbooks are a, are a must have. One is FRM Handbook by Philip Jorian. Other one is Options, Futures, and Other Derivatives by John C. Hull. John C. Hull for two reasons. One, uh, he has explained the concepts very well. So not only when you are doing FRM, but even further in your financial career. This textbook is a very useful one to have. And coming specifically from FRM perspective, the whole of FMP, financial market products, is in your textbook. That is, your GAP core reading for that is John C. Hull. That means even GAP recommend that you study the whole of financial market and financial market and products using John C. Hull book. So these two are the reasons why I strongly recommend this textbook. Uh, Kushal has a question for FRM part 1, how many online classes will be there? Um, so for that, we have answer for that too. Uh, so here is what you should look for, uh, Kushal. Okay? So basically you have 10 days of classroom trainings. Remember each training is of 5 hours of duration, which means you have totally 50 hours of training. Okay, and apart from that, you have mock tests, and uh, you also have 20 hours of online tests available. And Pristine obviously gives you material, which is FRM handbook and visualize FRM charts. Okay, and uh, before you ask, the fee is also mentioned here. Okay. Um, Suyash has a question: Are treasury rates and LIBOR risk rate risk-free rates. Uh, Suyash, strictly speaking, only treasury rates are risk-free rates. Okay? LIBOR is not a risk-free rate. Okay? Uh, strictly speaking, only treasury, that two T-bill rates, to be more precise, are risk-free rates. Okay? Why and how? I'll probably talk about that uh, when we do an actual session. Okay? Uh, Abiola says, can I know the actual price of a firm tutorial? Abiyala, hopefully now uh, this slide answers that question for you. It's around rupees 15,000. Okay. And Abiyala has one more question. How do I get 
FRM practice papers and past questions. As I said, Abiola, you should look at FRM handbook by uh, Philip Jorian. It's a very good, uh, he has a very good collection of questions and more importantly, he also solves the question for you. Okay, So that way, I think uh, it's a very useful, uh, uh, you know, book to have. Apart from that, uh, you always have the power of Google. Uh, so please try to Google around and see, uh, you know, what all question papers you come across. Try to solve them. So, so that, at least that is the method that I followed when I was writing for FRM. Um, okay, Gopal Krishna has a question. Can you please let me know how will be the opportunities in India, out of India, and FRM recognition in India? Gopal, that's a very uh, good question, right? Because most of us do something because we want to eventually get higher salary, right? So good news is your FRM is a global recognition, right? So I think uh, FRM is a degree. Uh, let me try to show you that, right? So FRM is more than a degree. It's basically a certification course by conducted by institute called GAP Institute, which is Global Association of Risk Professional USA. Okay, and it is a globally recognized program, which means that not only US, but any part of the world that you are. UK, uh, Asia, including India, FRM is a highly recognized program. Okay. Now, what can I get out of if I do an FRM designation? Once again, the answer is listed here. FRM, the focus is on financial risk management. So any career that you want to have on financial risk management, that may include being a risk analyst or operational risk management or even trading preparing structured products uh, and in most of us there is even credit rating agencies right so a lot of credit rating agencies in India and abroad such as Sybil, uh, you know Chrysal, S&P, Fitch they definitely would recognize an FRM certification okay and apart from that you have various uh, mutual fund and fund houses mutual fund or a hedge fund for them a risk management is a big uh, you know big topic of the day Again, they will recognize your FRM certification. You have an edge over others there too. A lot of banks, you know, they have a problem of understanding Basel regulations and following them, implementing them. FRM teaches you Basel regulations in complete detail. So once you finish FRM, you are a Basel expert, and once again, you have an edge over others in banking-related profiles. Okay. So these are some of the basic, um, you know, opportunities that get presented for you after you do FRM. In India, uh, FRM is really, really recognized because, uh, you know, in India, especially if you look at the banking sector, the Basel regulations have just started. So anybody who claims to be an expert in Basel regulation have a great career ahead in India, especially in the banking sector. So I think you have a great opportunity in India too. And what's best, if you want to migrate out of India, if you want to relocate in any part of the world, once again, FRM comes handy because FRM is a uh, globally recognized program. Okay. Uh, Brandon has a question. Uh, can I know where can I look for the PowerPoint slide you just show us? Uh, Brandon, are you talking about this slide? That is this PowerPoint presentation, or is it about the futures and uh, Okay, so Brandon says this is the current one. Yeah, the current one is available once again uh, in your, should be available for you on the Pristine website. If it is not available, please contact your Pristine uh, representative. Okay, so I'll basically give you uh, that information. These are all, uh, you know, persons. I'm on your side, you actually see a series of, uh, you know, uh, names and numbers. So please contact any of them. Uh, Dikshu in particular takes care of online classes, that is uh, your webinar classes. So please contact her and she will give you any information that you need, either in terms of uh, you know, how should I pay. In fact, for the payment, I'll give you, tell you, but any information that you need, whether let's say you are lost, you, you're not able to locate the link for the video recording of this session, you can ask her. If you made a payment and the payment didn't go through, you can ask her. Or if you have any questions on 
either getting accessing this presentation or anything else, again you can ask her. Okay. So these are dedicated career counselors who are willing to help you in uh, whatever question that you might have. Um, Abiola asks, can I know the bank details of Pristine as well as knowing when the class will start? Uh, Abiola, I think we're going to start the class sessions from next Sunday, if I'm not wrong. Once again, please contact uh, your coordinator. He or she will be able to give you that information. In terms of your uh, online details, I'm just trying to locate. Give me a moment. Uh, wait. Sorry for uh, you know moving around the slide a little fast. Uh, I remember there was a slide which showed your bank details. Okay. Oh, probably not. They've taken away. No issues. Uh, what you can do is uh, for making the payment, please contact uh, these set of ladies or gentlemen, right? <coughs> Sorry. Please contact uh, Dishu on this number given, and she will guide you with rest of the procedure. Okay. Uh, so Abiola and Brandon, I hope I answered your question. Let me know if there are if anything is not clear. Okay. Uh, Paresh says that I am servicing in a state bank of India as a relationship manager. Will a firm certificate be useful for me in career? Uh, Paresh says from where he is from and what is the minimum marks in a firm exam and what is the passing percentage of Pristine? Okay. Paresh, you have asked three questions, so I'll, let me try to answer them one after the other. Okay. Number one. You asked, uh, you basically you are working in State Bank of India as a relationship manager. So is it is FRM certificate useful for you? I think I already tried to answer that as an answer to a previous question. In banking sector, FRM is something that you should definitely look forward to because uh, anyway, in banking sector, your Basel regulations. I think you would already know Basel regulation is a big thing and. In India, we are still slowly warming up to Basel regulation. So if you look at things, I think Basel 1 is yet to be implemented, whereas Basel 2 and now even Basel 3 has come up. Okay. So if in FRM, the good thing is uh, uh, they teach you in detail about Basel 2. So and that is up to the recent industry trends. So definitely, you know, um, in banking sector, you have a very good profile if you do an FRM uh, certification. Okay. Apart from that. Uh, risk management is also an important fact, facet of any banking profile, right? You need to know how to make sure, how to identify risk in your portfolio, how to manage risk, how to do asset liability management, right? So once again, for that, FRM is a very useful program to have, okay? So to answer to your first question, is it useful for you in your career? Definitely. Now, the other question that you asked, what is the minimum passing marks for FRM exam? Good news there is FRM exam is graded using relative valuation. That is, it is it is percentile based. Okay. So whenever students ask me this question, I usually tell them that there are two things that you should feel happy about of an FRM exam. Number one, it's a multiple choice questions. Each question have four choices, A, B, C, A, D, and there is no negative marking. Okay, which means that if you trust your luck and you simply put one of the choice and if your luck is with you, the choice happens to be the right answer, you may still go through and pass the exam. Okay, so that's one good thing. Other one is that the gradation is a relative valuation. It is a percentile based. So what do you mean by percentile based? Let's say the topper got, I'll give you a uh, situation, right? In an absolute gradation system, what happens? Let's say if I say 50% is the passing mark. Okay, let's say that year the paper was very very difficult. In which case, let's say assume hypothetically only three people wrote the exam. One got 50.5%, and the other person got 50%. The third person got 49.5%. Now, if it is an absolute gradation, there is a hard cutoff saying that only if you score more than 50%, you are passed. So only this guy and this guy passes. Whereas this guy fails. But if you look at the actual situation, there's no difference between our second guy and the third guy. They're only off by 0.5%. Isn't it harsh that this guy fails to make the cutoff only because of 
a 0.5 difference. That's why the concept of relative valuation came. So in relative valuation, what you do is, whoever is a topper, whatever marks he gets is rated as 100th percentile. Okay? And all others' marks are relatively valued. So what that means, 50% becomes 50 out of 50.5, not 50 out of 100. 49.5 becomes 49.5 out of 50.5. Okay? So now if you look at it, probably this guy will be 99th percentile. This guy will be 98th percentile. Okay? And therefore, if they draw a line saying that if you are anywhere above 70th percentile, you pass the exam. In which case, all three of them pass the exam. Okay? So the moral of the story is, two things are good for you. Number one, it's a multiple choice questions, no negative marking. You can trust your uh, luck, write the exam, pass it. Number two, if you found the exam to be difficult, and others also found the exam to be difficult, so that actually increases your chances of passing the exam because on a relative valuation, you may actually be very close to each other. You may be very close to the topper. Okay, so that's the point. You know, there is no minimum mark required. Rather, it's more a relative valuation. Okay, Parish. Now to answer your third question, that is, <coughs> sorry, what is the past percentage of pristine in the past? Let me bring your attention to the slide. The answer is given there. Around 65 to 85 percent of students have usually passed if they are based out of if they have attended pristine lectures. All right. So hopefully I have answered all your questions, Parish. Let me know. Gopal Krishna has a question: Is three months enough to clear FRM level one? Yes, definitely three months is enough to clear FRM level one. Um, you know, the key is for FRM level one. I think we mentioned that here. Look at the blue line. Focus study is the order of the day. That means you have to study. I would say that definitely try to study once a day, at least two hours a day. If you're studying on a daily basis, three months is more than enough for you to pass the exam. On the other hand, if you're only studying on weekends, even if you're putting superhuman efforts, even if you're putting 17 hours a day for weekends, it's going to be still a tough call. Try to study every day, just two hours every day, you are easily on the right track. Uh, Jesse has a question, can you please tell me how much is the class's amount in USD? Uh, Jesse, please uh, contact uh, you know, uh, the coordinator because I, I can't uh, commit on the right uh, FX rate right now. Um, so please contact your, um, you know, uh, the name of the coordinator that I've listed here, uh, in particular Dikshu. She'll be able to help you, okay? Because uh, unfortunately, USD amount depends on the current FX rate, uh, so you should ask Christine primarily, okay? Um, Gita Anjali has a question: When will the next online session be conducted in detail? Uh, primarily, it will be, uh, as I said, most likely. I think we are starting to planning to start the batch next Sunday, uh, which will be seventeenth um, of February, okay? Um, Suyash has a question, are the Basel Accords 1, 2 and 3 part of FRM? Yes, uh, uh, not 3 because Basel 3 is still being fleshed out, uh, but Basel 1 and 2 are definitely part of your FRM syllabus. They are not part of your FRM level 1, they are part of your FRM level 2. Okay, FRM part 1 or level 1 exam is more a foundation course. So the idea of splitting that into level 1 and level 2 is that in uh, foundation course level 1, anybody who is who comes even from a non-financing background, gets some basic knowledge to learn details of finance. So level one is more like a foundation course, where you get, uh, you get, you get basic understanding of finance. Level two is where your meat of the program is. Level two is where you understand really about what is your market risk, how do you manage credit risk, how do you manage operation risk, and then you study about basal, basal accounts, etc., etc. Okay. So level two is the real. Uh, Advantage out of FRM program. Suyash has a question. Do you, con do you guys conduct weekend classes? In fact, Suyash, we only conduct weekend classes. Okay? So classes happen only on Saturday and Sunday. Uh, for online, primarily, the classes happen 5 p.m. to 10 p.m. IST. Okay? Indian Standard Time. So we only have classes on Saturday and Sunday because 
as I said, I, I also have a day job. I actually work for a hedge fund. Um, so I am myself busy during Monday to Friday. Okay. Uh, so there are no classes as of now conducted on weekdays. All the classes only happen on weekends. Um, Sudeep has a question. Can you please run through the course material provided by Pristine again? Uh, Sudeep, I'm not sure what course material you're talking about. So we already did, I think you joined uh, this demo a little late. Uh, anyway, I'll just tell you, uh, we did a small demo on a particular topic which was uh, forward. You know, we try to understand what is a forward, uh, etc, etc. And uh, now we are actually very close to finishing the demo. Uh, so the second half of the demo, we are trying to answer any questions that you might have uh, with respect to FRM exam. That is, how do I approach uh, the exam? What is the exam all about? And etc, etc, like that. Okay. And um, the, uh, you know, the, now for your benefit, since you joined late, uh, you need not worry because the whole session, the whole two hour demo session is being recorded as we speak and within a day or two, uh, a video, a link to the video recording will be provided to you. In which case, you can still catch up on what happened prior to you join. Okay? So that's not a concern for you. All right? Uh, and uh, if you look at the slide, I have listed uh, a series of uh, individuals and their number. So please contact any one of them. Uh, to get details of how can I access uh, the video recording. They will be able to help you out. Okay. Uh, Suyash has a concern. I only have Friday and Saturday off. How can I attend weekend classes? Suyash, uh, yeah, I understand, but I think, uh, you know, uh, that's the irony of life. Okay. Uh, once again, you please uh, contact uh, your, um, you know, your uh, career counselors, the numbers that I have listed here. So at least Saturday classes you can attend. Uh, Sunday classes we'll see. You know how how can we uh, provide an alternative for you? Uh, prob probably an alternative could be uh, that if you are running another webinar session in parallel. So what happens is sometimes your sessions happen for multiple batches. So just to give you an example, right? So let's say this Saturday Sunday I'm going to take up quants one on Saturday and quants two on Sunday. But for some other batch, on Sunday I'm going to take quants one. Okay. Uh, the what can happen is, or yeah. So, so basically, what I'm saying is, let's say if you missed a regular session, you can still hook on to the same class on some other batch. So that way, I think we are pretty flexible. You know, we don't stop you saying that oh, if you are part of this batch, you only part of, you can only attend classes for this batch. Okay. You can always hook on to the same classes happening on some other batch. So that way probably you can uh, catch up on classes that you miss. Okay. Once again, please talk to Dikshu or um, any one of the person listed here. They'll be able to help you out on how, how can we uh, you know, move around things for your benefit. Uh, Uh, Gopal says, I heard that only Sunday classes are available. Is that true in Hyderabad? Um, yes, I think as of now in Hyderabad, uh, we are running Sunday only batch. So that's true. Okay. Um, apart from that, we are also running these uh, batches. That is, we are also running these uh, online classes, which I think will happen Saturday and Sunday. Okay. Once again, please contact Alankar. So I am also stay, uh, based on Hyderabad, and I actually take in-person classes for Hyderabad batches. Okay. In fact, for this FRM batch, I have already taken a couple of sessions. Okay. So please contact Alankar, who, who manages Hyderabad in Chennai. He'll be able to help you out. Okay. Paresh has one more question. I'm planning to prepare for CFA level one exam. Uh, is there any correlation between FRM and CFA? Uh, yes, Paresh. So what he says usually there is a 20% overlap. Okay. There is a 20% overlap between what CFA level one and FRM level one, and interestingly, there is another 20% overlap between FRM level one and CFA level two. Okay, so overall there is a 40% overlap that you can think about. Um, 
and in three months, if I study two two hours for both of them, is it possible to clear? Uh, okay. Um, yes. So yes, I think definitely you can give both uh, FRM and CFA together. Uh, FRM level one happens during November, and I think CFA level one exam happens during December, uh, or if if you're talking more about June. FRM level 1 happens during May and F CFA level 1 will happen during June. So both are possible, we can definitely give both together. There is a good 20% overlap, so that's definitely beneficial for you. Okay. Um, Pare says, uh, since you say it's a relative evaluation, if there are 80 questions in FRM 1 and if 35 is correct, then I will pass or fail. Paresh, as I said, uh, you don't know. Okay. First and foremost, there are 100 questions in FRM 1. Okay? There are going to be 100 questions on FRM part 1. Even if you do 35 questions, it doesn't mean that you fail. Why? Because it really depends on what the topper did. Let's say if the topper only could answer 40 questions, then you are not that different from topper. Okay? In which case, you may still pass the exam. So it really depends on how others have also fared on the exam. You get my point? Um, so that is the trick in these cases, right? That is, even if let's say you have done only 10 questions right, that doesn't mean that you fail the exam. Because what happens if everybody could only manage, let's say, 10 questions right? In which case, suddenly you may be the topper. Okay? So relative evaluation means, I don't care how many questions you got it right, I only care how many you got it right in comparison to others. Okay? And when it comes to CFA, exactly the same procedure is followed. So CFA is also percentile based. That means it's only relative evaluation. And there also, same procedure. That is, the topper gets 100 percentile and everybody else is relatively graded according to him. Alright? Uh, so I hope that answered your question, Parish. Gopal says, uh, online classes are yet to start or already started. Online classes are starting. Uh, so online classes for webinar, that is this batch, FRM batch, is going to start from 17th of February, that is next Sunday onwards. Uh, Suyash says, can we have your contact number or email ID? Uh, Suyash, unfortunately, no, uh, because as per regulatory reasons, I can't reveal my contact number or email ID for demo students. Okay? If you become part of Pristine and if you're already part of, and if I'm already day, doing a Pristine classes, then at least there is some provision for me, uh, but unfortunately, as of today, I can't. So I hope to see you in an FRM batch, in which case probably we can exchange our contact IDs. All right? Apologies for that. OK, guys, uh, any other question? Shall I assume that uh, all your questions regarding FRM has been answered? Once again, those who came late, as I said, you can always get a video recording of this session. Hopefully, that will give you some better idea because most of the questions were already answered. Suyash has a question, is there any generic email ID to ask the FRM queries? I told you that, Suyash, right? So in Pristine, there is something called as a Pristine Forum. Okay. So once you become a member of Pristine, that is once you pay your uh, uh, amount, uh, you get a link to Pristine Forum, you can always put the query there. Uh, Abiola says, can you please explain more about the 20% difference between FRM and CFA? Uh, it's not 20% difference, it's actually 20% overlap. Okay? So Abiola, what we are saying is, let's say if you prepare for CFA level 1, then 20% of FRM level 1 you have already covered, because the same concepts are included in both CFA level 1 as well as FRM level 1. This is 20% overlap. Which means that 80%, so let's say if you give CFA level 1, then 20% of FRM level 1 you have already covered as part of studying for CFA level 1. Remaining 80% is where you should put in additional effort. Okay? So it's not 20% difference, it's 20% overlap. Make sense? And same thing between FRM level 1 and CFA level 2. So incidentally, some of the concepts that you study in FRM level 1 are actually included as part of CFA level 2 program. 
Okay. So once again, there is a 20 percent overlap between FRM level one and CFA level two, which means that let's say, so if you finish CFA level one, 20 percent of FRM level one is already covered. You study for the remaining 80 percent. Then when you start giving for level two, 20 percent of what you are going to study in level two is already covered in FRM level one. Okay. All right. Um, any other question, guys? Gopal Krishna has an interesting question. Is FRM difficult or CFA difficult? Um, Gopal, I would say probably neither. Okay. Uh, I think both these exams are definitely not that difficult. But again, it depends on what your interest and how you study. Okay. We all make this difficult because we don't study them properly. Okay. See, let's be honest, right? Most of us are working, and uh, while you are working, it's very difficult to allocate time for studies. And that is the problem with both CFA and FRM. That is, you need to study while you are working. Okay. The other difference between CFA and FRM and relative difficulty happens on how much mathematically oriented are you. Okay. Um, if you like mathematics very much, then FRM you probably like because FRM is a little bit more intensive on mathematics, but CFA is a little less intensive on mathematics. So depending on whether you are a mathematics person or not, you might like FRM or you might not like FRM. Okay. So that's more related difficulty, but still believe me, I don't think either of the exam, FRM or CFA is difficult. We only make it difficult for ourselves by not studying. As I said, if you study every two hours, uh, if you study two hours every day, um, for next three months, there is no way that you will not pass the exam. Okay? Um, Abiola has a question concerning John C. Hull textbook, which edition is the best? Um, Abiola, I'll recommend you get eighth edition. Okay? Uh, but I think it's very limited publication. So if you get anything about seventh edition, that should be good enough. Okay? For exam perspective, if you, if you just manage to get seventh edition, that is good enough. For the matter, even sixth edition is good enough. Okay? So between sixth, seventh, or eighth edition, any edition you have, you are good enough. Okay? But I'll obviously recommend eighth edition. But I, re I recognize that it's not easily available every, everywhere. Okay. Any other question, guys? Kopal says, how much will it cost? I see it costs around 5K. Yes, it will cost you around 5K. Uh, you know, especially, it's, it will become a little uh, less costly if you order through online portals like eBay or uh, Flipkart. Still, it will be a good amount of three to four k. Um, you know what I did especially was that you know one of us would purchase a book and we all will take Xerox version of it. Even though I'm not supposed to uh, be saying this because it's ethically not right, but especially if you are in a group of several students, you can probably think of something like that. Okay, but yeah, at least somebody has to purchase uh, the textbook first. Gopal says, I found a book in Himalaya Book Center. Yes, it's available in Himalaya Book Center also. Uh, he says, I could find it at 650 rupees. I'm not sure about that, uh, Gopal. Um, just make sure that uh, you know it's John C. Hull book. And uh, if you actually have that book, and the name of the textbook is Futures, Options, and Other Derivatives. If that is the case, uh, if you got it at uh, 650, that's nice. You know. See, I, I think uh, there is one Indian... Uh, edition of John C. Hull book where it's co-authored by John C. Hull and some Indian author. I forgot the name of the Indian author. He's some professor in IIM. Okay? Uh, so that is more an Indian edition of uh, the same textbook. Uh, in which case, you know, uh, the only difference is the examples that they take up is more Indian uh, economy oriented. Whereas when it comes to uh, FRM exam in particular, um, you know, FRM is an exam conducted by GAP Institute, which is based on USA. So it will be much easier to understand if you take the original edition, because then the examples are more uh, tuned towards US economy. Uh, but yeah, I think you know, uh, I don't think I have a real preference between them, uh, but I still prefer the original US edition version.
Um, Shiva so says, I have third custom edition for GAP 2013 for all the four books. You mean you have the third uh, core edition of GAP? That should be good. Suyash, so, uh, you can go for that. That's good enough. Core readings, see, I think the problem is even the core readings are definitely recommended. From a, uh, The problem from an exam perspective is that they're too detailed. Okay, so since there is so much of detail in studying them, um, so let us be honest, right? We have only three or four months left for the exam. Uh, code reading, even though it's the best way to understand a concept and appear for the exam, uh, it is a challenge managing time. So that's why your other books like uh, John C. Hull or FRM handbooks becomes useful, or even uh, something like a Scripture textbook becomes useful. Okay, so because these things give you a much uh, concise, uh, you know, representation of what you study in code reading, and from an exam perspective, sometimes. That's better because you only focus on what you are supposed to learn from exam perspective. Okay, but having said that, definitely your core textbooks are the best way to learn a concept. No question about it. Parish has a question: If I join Pristine, then will extra books be provided by Pristine if I pay cost? Which is difficult available in Gujarat. Parish, uh, yes, that is a choice. Uh, once again, please contact. You know uh, your uh, numbers listed here. Uh, someone of them will definitely help you out. Okay, it's not a problem. Please contact anyone uh, whose name is listed here, and he or she will be able to help you out with, uh, you know, any such requirement that you might have. Gopal says, "Can I buy India edition book?" Yes, Gopal. As I said, you know, I don't really have an objection to Indian edition book, um, but if you ask me, I personally prefer the U.S. edition books. Having said that, from an exam perspective, even Indian edition book is good enough. Not a problem. Okay. Um, Gitanjali says, "Can we study uh, scripture books for the exam?" Yes, scripture books are also good uh, because scripture also gives you a good, concise representation of core GAP core readings. So that is also good. But I still feel that you want to consider something like a John C. Hull book at least. An FRM handbook is also useful. FRM handbook is more useful when you go to level two, not so much in level one. So if I were you, probably I'll take a scripture material and supplement that with John C. Hull book. And for level two probably it will be FRM handbook. Uh, so please Suresh, I answered your part also. That is, yeah, you can also look into PDF file that you download. That's okay, okay. Um, Parish has a question, if I purchase books from uh, GAP and join Pristine, then it must, then it is must to be Philip, Hand, Philip Handbook and Option Majority. Yes. So as I said, please uh, contact, uh, um, you know, your Pristine representative. The numbers are given here. He or she will be definitely able to help you uh, on whatever you want to do. Okay. And any special requirement that you might have saying that if I pay money, will you please courier me the books? Definitely will be considered. Vakata Krishnan uh, asked a question. I joined late. Uh, sorry. I request how we mark answers in answer sheets on the exam because marking a wrong answer or rubbing it to correct needs a special way of answering as per FRM guideline. Yes, Vakata Krishnan. So, what you should uh, realize is on the exam you will be given an OMR sheet. Okay. OMR means optical marker reader. And there will be circles given for choices A, B, C, and D. Uh, the most appropriate circle has to be darkened. So number one, you should use only HP pencil. Okay. And number two, what I would do is, as and when when I go through the question, there are four circles given. I'll first put a dot, small dot, on the question that I think is right. Okay. And then. I keep doing this because if I have to rub, if I have to change the question, I can simply use an eraser and place the dot sometime later. So if I have to revise the question, instead of erasing something like this, it's much easier to erase something like this. Okay? <coughs> Sorry. So this is a possibility. That is, uh, what I usually do is I put a small dot on the choice that I think is most appropriate. And during probably the last 10 minutes of the exam, I'll, ha I'll darken all such choices. So that way, you know, 
in between if I have to revise my answer, if it is a small dot, it's easy to erase. The guideline given by GAP is, if you have already darkened a circle and you want to edit it, then you have to put a cross. Put a cross and then darken some other choice. Okay. The challenge there is your cross has to be prominently visible. It has to be also equally dark. For the OMR reader to know that is actually not the right answer. You are revising the answer. Okay. And that is what makes it difficult. So if you don't put your cross properly, then it will, and if you have hardened, darkened this circle, then the reader will get confused saying that there are two answers that you have given. Okay. And it will not value that question. So that's a challenge. So hopefully, Mekhita Krishna, you got uh, some idea about what we're talking about. Okay. Komalan has a question. I joined the webinar a late, a bit late. What types of calculators are allowed on the exam? So there are only two calculators allowed on the exam. One is Texas Instrument BA2 Plus, and even Professional Edition is allowed. Okay. And the other uh, allowed calculator is HP12C. Okay. Unless you have a preference, I strongly recommend go for this calculator, which is Texas Instruments BA2 Plus Professional. Okay, it's a very good calculator to have, and not only for uh, FRM, even for your uh, CFA and other uh, examinations, the same calculators are allowed. So that way, I think you know this calculator can be used for many more such certification exams in future. Uh, Suyash has a question, is 4 hours enough to answer 100 questions? Definitely, 4 hours is more than sufficient to answer 100 questions. Okay, uh, so not, not an issue. In fact, you will also have one or two, uh, you will at least be left with half an hour of spare time to revise your questions too, or rather revise your answers to the questions. Okay, so that's not a concern. Alright guys, uh, so let me know if there are any other questions, otherwise I will end the demo for today. Um, um, Venkata Krishnan has a point. I've earlier viewed pristine videos, but um, how to use financial calculator is not taught very well. Um, so, any tips on them? Venkata Krishnan, not to worry. If I am taking classes, I'll make sure that I explicitly tell you how to use your calculator. Okay? Because I completely agree. Uh, using the calculator is a very important strategy for doing well on the exam. Okay? And definitely, we will cover that as part of your pristine classes. Okay, so don't worry. If we are doing, um, if I'm taking the class, I'll ensure. I promise you that I'll give you tips on how to use the calculator efficiently. Okay, most likely we will do that during your quants class. Okay, so don't worry on that. All right, guys. Um, so I think uh, 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 there is. Um, there is one more from Paresh. He says only FRM books from GAP and materials from Pristine are enough to pass FRM one. Uh, Paresh, as I said, FRM books from GAP. Apart from that, uh, try to have FRM handbook by Philip Jorian and options derivatives and other options features and other derivatives by John C. Hull. So I recommend those two also in addition to FRM GAP books and Pristine materials. So I would say. A combination of these uh, would give you a good chance of passing the exam. All right. Uh, all right, guys. So I think uh, we are coming to an end of the session. Uh, Venkata Krishna has a question: Has FRM brought out any updated handbook after sixth edition? I don't think. I think the latest version of FRM handbook by Philip Jorian is actually sixth edition. So I have not. I'm not at least I'm not aware of any recent uh, uh, you know updates to the to the edition. Okay. Anyway, your sixth edition is good enough, and if you already have it, uh, even better. Okay. All right, guys. Uh, so thank you very much. It was nice interacting with you. Uh, I wish all of you uh, a great future ahead, and all the best in your future endeavors. And I definitely hope to see you interacting more with you uh, in some of the future. Uh, you know, FRM webinar programs. All right, thank you very much for me. Uh, have a great uh, week ahead and a great rest of the weekend that you have with you. All right, thank you. Bye. Good night.
I'll end the uh, demo session now. The organizer has ended the session and this